Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining. My name is Andres Martinez. I'm the editorial director of Future Tense. Future Tense is a partnership between New America, our host this evening, Arizona State University, and Slate Magazine. We are a citizen's guide to the future. We're both a section on the Slate website where you can read content on a daily basis that looks at the implications for society of emerging technologies. And we have a lot of forums and discussions like this evening's, where we like bringing people together around provocative questions. You can follow us in, on Twitter at Future Tense now. Some upcoming events that we are hosting at Future Tense on November 8th, we are posing the question why we should imagine solar flares taking down space stations. So I hope, I hope that's intriguing enough. And then on the 14th of November, uh, we are doing an event on the history of the future, looking at past predictions of where we are today and what we can learn from those predictions. Um, just in terms of housekeeping items, please silence your cell phones. I haven't done that myself, but I will as soon as I sit down. Um, during the Q&A, please wait for a microphone and identify yourself. Um, and with that, I really am excited for this conversation um, and tonight's uh, subject matter of the role the arts play in allowing technology to build a better future. And we have a fantastic uh, panel tonight. And I'm just going to hand things off um, by introducing our moderator for the evening, Eric Malinsky. Eric is a reporter, to the to far right, is a reporter at WNYC Studio 360 with Kurt Anderson. And he hosts a podcast for Panoply about sci-fi and other fantasy genres called Imaginary Worlds. I, I mentioned to Eric before we came on stage that I was listening earlier today to the latest podcast uh, where he looks at the origins of the Haunted Mansion at Disneyland, um, and it was, it was fascinating. Uh, having been at Disneyland a couple of times at various stages of my life, um, I, I didn't realize that Walt Disney himself was confused as to whether he wanted the experience to be humorous or scary, and if you've been to the Haunted Mansion, that, that, kind of, that confusion kind of comes across, so I highly recommend um, Imaginary Worlds. And Eric, thank you so much for being our moderator tonight. Thanks. Thanks. For, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so today, uh, we're going to discuss does technology need the arts to build a better future? And you know, we're at an interesting point in space exploration where, well, NASA seems to always be facing this existential question as to whether, where is this all going and is this, all, is this worth the money? At the same time, you've got billionaires like Elon Musk who are making space accessible to the super rich or anybody who has access. And the artists here with me to my left are looking at, well, why, you know, why not make space accessible to everybody? Why not democratize, democratize space? And how can we have a feeling when we look up at the stars that it belongs to all of us? So first, uh, on my immediate left, is um, Juan Jose Diaz in front Infante, he is the director of the Mexican Space Collective, a group of artists that builds and launches nano satellites as a platform for art projects. And he also runs a satellite school to teach non-engineers how to build their own space technology. Tavares Strachan is a conceptual artist based in New York, originally from the Bahamas. His most famous piece, The Distance Between What We Have and What We Want, he transported two and a half ton block of ice from the Arctic to his childhood was it your elementary school? Elementary school. Uh, he's also trained as a cosmonaut in Star City, Russia, which I really want to talk to him about. That influenced his multimedia work. Ortho, uh, orthostatic tolerance, it might not be such a bad idea if I never went home. So thank you guys for coming. And we're going to start by looking at some images of their work. And then we're going to talk amongst ourselves. And we'll open it up for, for Q&A. So now let's see whether I know how to use this. This is very exciting. I uh, don't believe I do. Is there any way, as we, as we discuss technology in the future? Uh, well that, that part I got. There we go. All right. Just the right button. Uh, the right button. Great. All righty. So first thing we want to discuss is this little guy over here. Um, this is a. OK. This is a. Oh, cool. I was just saying this. Is, I, I've been binging on Doctor Who lately, and I feel like this is like a. <laughs> this is I, I, there's some wonderful explanation that David Tennant could give about this. 
Um, tell me about Ulysses. Tell me in the Mexican Space Collective, what was the idea behind all of that? And I assume that was an initial sketch of prototype. It was the original yeah. drawing. Yeah. Uh, my problem was that I became 50. Hmm. So I woke up one morning and I realized the future was not there. So I had been watching all these Kubrick films and 2001 and suddenly that, that for me it was all that future was a promise. So I had a middle age crisis in which I decided either to buy a convertible or start building satellites. And I made the wrong choice and I started building satellites. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was just this re-engineering of, yeah. of my life. And of course I couldn't pretend to be a scientist because I'm a photographer, so it's very difficult to lie in that direction. Mm -hmm. So it had to be a piece of art. So I thought, you know, if you are going to be starting lying to people, if you make it a poetic and if you make it an artistic uh, mission, and also Mexico is not a very scientifically prone uh, place, so we decided to make it an, an art piece and a poetic piece, and that, that's how it started. So what, who are the Mexican Space Collective? Well, originally it started as a concept because you cannot be the author of a satellite. So the, the idea of working something technologically is always a team effort. And we do not know how to work as a, as a team. We, we think that we work as a team, but we work in an environment of competition. So the idea is that the collective and the problems of the collective have to be worked around. So I designed a collective without no one. And I decided that this collective that had no one yet would be the one that would make the, the satellite because it was like the right authorship that, that needed. And from there, I started inviting people that was needed for the project. And uh, I started with 11 artists because that's the number of a soccer team. <laughs> and I decided that if you are trying to engage into a team effort and, and a world problem and a world trying to live as a collective, FIFA has more members than the UN. <laughs> so I, I would go with FIFA. So did you, I mean, you know, I, I, we are talking earlier, I mean, I've seen videos on YouTube where somebody just like hooks their iPhone to a rocket and shoots it up into space. I mean, was it as easy as that or did you have to get per, uh, official permission for well, this? Well, it's, it's the same problem as poetry or painting. It's, it's when you arrive to a museum and you have a person that, is, that goes to the painting and says, I can do that. But it's, it's a different way to mention how, how you say it. And it's, I can do that, is a totally different approach to poetry. And uh, uh, the, the, the problem is, it is as easy as that, but when you are a citizen that wakes up one morning and decides to launch a satellite, it, it became an international issue. Because no one had done it in that way. A lot of people join in into a scientific community, or they join in into a university, and I did it the other way around. I asked the university to join me to do this thing. So the conversation was, it's, it's as easy as you, as you say it, it's just the way you converse with the people is, is totally different. But was this one of those things where it just took a really, really long time and you were just keeping getting referred to, well, you need permission from this person and this person kind of thing, or? Well, no, the, pro my, the original problem was my visa card. Yeah. So I was buying components from China and my card got canceled. So I called visa the same way that you call and the people of visa said, uh, your card, your credit has been canceled. And I ask why, and they say, uh, suspicious behavior. So I say, well, exactly what does that mean? I mean, how, how do I clear myself from suspicious behavior? OK, you are, you are building a satellite, and we've you know, got on, my, our algorithm has gotten on that you are buying technology that cannot be exported to Mexico. And uh, in Mexico, no one, there's no, there's no NASA. There, no one launches anything from Mexico. You are not a university. You are not a research group. So therefore, this is suspicious behavior. And you have to call the Department of Defense right here in Pennsylvania. 
I you had to doing? call the U.S. Department of Defense to launch a, a, a nano satellite in yeah, Mexico. Yeah, yeah, there is no Department of Defense of Mexico. But why would the U.S. Department of Defense have your jurisdiction? <laughs> because <laughs> I was exporting technology to Mexico that shouldn't be exported to Mexico. Wow. And I had to swear in the phone that I was not going to share my poetry with an enemy of the United States. <laughs> so I called Captain John Smith at the Pentagon. Mm. And His name really was John Smith? No, oh, of course okay. not. But <laughs> like, well, for these purposes, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> we, we call him John Smith. So he says, excuse me, Captain, but I'm trying to launch a satellite, and it seems that I need permission from you. And John Smith said, son, uh, I need to know what your satellite is going to be doing. And when I told him, well, it's poetry. And you could hear him telling everyone in the room, we have a poet. <laughs> 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 How do you do the manifest of a, of a poetry satellite? Mm. And that, that conversation lasted three months before I could get a, a $1 cell exported from San Diego to Mexico City. Mm. And from there onwards, I, I had to use contraband. Really? Yeah, but very bad hombres helped me. <laughs> <laughs> I love these drawings, too. They look like uh, something out of a Buck Rogers. Well, um, very, very Da Vinci. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, of course, absolutely. Same, Buck Rogers, Da Vinci. They're very, yeah, the they're very close. <laughs> <laughs> very, very close. Um, and so, so where do these components come from exactly? Uh, you're saying some of them actually came from like Radio Shack? Yes. When you're launching thi things at 300 kilometers, you can buy them anywhere, mm. more or less, because the mission only lasts four months. And then you're also saying, you know, you said a couple times, Mexico, we don't launch anything. Like, was this, I mean, what, symbolically, what, what did this mean to you? And, you know, on, starting with the midlife crisis all the way up to, you know, the nation. Well, <laughs> and the aspirations and hopes and dreams. It, it, was, it was very strange that the Department of Defense had to give you permission to, to uh, bring cells mm -hmm. that come in any toy. I mean, I could have bought the toy, bring it, mm. take the cells out, put them into my satellite. And on the other hand, you start realizing uh, what exactly is happening in countries that are not developed. The imaginary of what the, the countries that have not reach development yet, and how the global conversation has to be uh, happening. So the idea of Ulysses was to be a little bit of a Sputnik. You know, when the Sputnik was launched, it was a basketball, and it, it had a radio the same as this one, and it went for 23 days, and suddenly the whole world was in a panic. And I'm trying to create that panic in Mexico. <laughs> 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 this, no, 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 there's a Mexican satellite in the sky. All right, so what we have here, uh, tell, us, tell us what we're looking at right here. Okay, that's the book fair in Guadalajara, which is the largest book fair in Mexico, and I got permission to launch a nanosatellite to the stratosphere from there. And it was a very complicated uh, launch, even though it seems very simple to send it in a balloon. We had to stop air traffic of Guadalajara. Guadalajara is like the second largest city in, in, in Mexico. So we were trying to explain to people at the control tower that we were in the middle of the city with a lot of tra air traffic, and we were going to launch this satellite up from a book fair in a homage to Jules Verne and the 100th anniversary of the, the trip to the, the man to the moon, I mean, from Earth to the moon novel. So basically, the idea was launching from a book fair was the idea of there. And of course, we got a bunch of scientists to help us to do this stratosphere mission, and they lost the satellite. So that was the last time we ever saw that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you, so you've launched two so far? Yes. Two. How do you, I mean, when it goes up, how do you, do you, do you just simply know, well, we've, you know, it's supposed to go in this direction. We hope it has. I mean, can you keep track of it? No, we were relying on the scientists to know that you know, to buy a GPS. But suddenly, scientists have this complicated mind in which they do things complicated because they are complicated people. And <laughs> so they lost it because they wanted to lose it. I mean, they never thought that we would do it. Hmm. So the day that, okay, guys, we have to launch it, no one was ready for, for the launch. So 
Uh, the way that you catch that one up is there is a program in Google and you put uh, how much helium you used, uh, how big the balloon is, where you are, your geography, and it will tell you where it lands. It's, it's a relatively simple if you know that. Mm. Now the problem with this one is if you haven't done it before or if you're going to launch something to space, there has to be a 15 meter distance between the parachute and the balloon. Because when it blows up the balloon, it wraps the parachute and it just brings it down in a, in a faster mode. So here, my friends, the scientists didn't know that rule of the 15 meters between the parachute and the balloon. It's funny with any kind of artwork that is that deals with untraditional materials, very often the artist has to learn all this kind of scientific, technological, mechanical thing that you didn't know before. This must be interesting, all the facts that you suddenly know about space, launching things into space. Well, it, 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 the thing is you start learning a lot because a lot of people have too much knowledge. So as soon as you tell them I want to launch a satellite, people look at you and say, it's very complicated, it costs you a million dollars. Uh, we need to buy a new lab. We have to hire NASA. Th they start making it very big. It has to be very so that there's no way that it can be done. And basically what I did is, okay, well, what, there has to be a simpler way to do it. So I've been coming up with the simpler solutions to, but sometimes you forget and you lose the satellite. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's get on Tavares. So we have, I have, there's bigger thematic questions too, but I want to talk to both of you guys about that. So let's start with some of Tavares' images here. Um, now you, you grew up in the Bahamas, you've always been interested in space and it seems like uh, deep sea and Arctic exploration yeah. as well. Um, what did that mean to you growing up? I think uh, it, for, for me it was, uh, it was two things. I think one was uh, feeling a, a deep sense of isolation um, and the other was pure boredom, which is a very important ingredient. Yeah. So well, there's been a lot of studies that boredom actually that we're we're not as bored as we used to be because of all of our devices and we're potentially less creative because of it. Yeah. Um, there, there was no device. <laughs> 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 Tell me, this is called is this called is it, Let's see my mother's house from the from the moon, right? Yeah. Tell me about this piece. So um, I was I think around 2009, I believe. I was invited uh, to be an uh, artist in residence at MIT. Uh, and during this time, I was working with the Lyft Center, which is, uh, which, which is MIT's art space. And uh, the curator at the time, Jane Farber, invited me to come do a visit uh, and see if I wanted, was interested in working with any of the labs at, the, at, at MIT. And uh, I made a, a seven, uh, uh, page bucket list of what I would want to do and uh, fortunately all of the labs responded very well and so this was one that I collaborated with at the uh, 3D Systems Microfabrication Lab uh, and <coughs> basically we built this 22 micron house in the laboratory at MIT um, and, the I and the idea was when you were looking at it in the, in the exhibition space uh, where you were standing would represent the moon and is that physical that scale. Is that actually your mother's house? Uh, or a representation of it, I guess. That's a good question. Um, if you look at your driver's license and you see your face on it, is that actually your face? This is, all, this is an old Pablo Picasso question. Mm -hmm. is, your, is your face that size? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a famous quote about Gertrude Stein said to him, Pablo, the painting doesn't look like me. And he said, it will someday. <laughs> And so this is Invisible Rocket. Tell me about this piece. Yeah, so a um, uh, group of uh, family and friends of mine uh, got together and we, we decided that we wanted to uh, try and get uh, as many of the ingredients that were familiar to us into space. And so in the, in, on the islands we have a lot of uh, salt and sand, which are the ingredients for glass making, which is something that I, I'm familiar with, and uh, salt, again, for, for fuel uh, and sugar. So I started devising these plants to produce these rockets that would, would be, be made from these materials. Um, 
you know, I think one of the things that goes missing uh, in, in the Bahamas and the islands in, in general is, you know, there's this long historical narrative that these places are empty and desolate, uh, and that they're devoid of, of any sort of um, future potential. Uh, and from the, from the 1500s to, to almost to the present, that's kind of the pervading narrative. So, uh, you know, we were talking about resources in Mexico and scientific resources in Mexico. I think there's, there's sort of a, a parallel conversation about um, how do we, how do we uh, engage questions of manufacturing and production uh, in these sort of scientific modalities in places that are quote unquote been, been labeled as desolate. Yeah, which I think would bring us to, I think that's um, from the <coughs> side view, um, but uh, what's the other thing? Um, this is Blast Off, right? Yeah. Yeah, tell me, tell me about Blast Off. Um, you, this is where you, uh, you launched and crashed a rocket? We, we lost a bunch, we like, <laughs> we lost several rockets. Welcome to the club paint. I feel out of it, I haven't, I haven't lost or launched a rocket yet. Uh, and um, I think one of the interesting things that I'm, I've been thinking a lot about lately is the intersection between uh, the sort of poetic space, uh, picture making, basically lying, uh, and this sort of alternate reality of, of uh, the sort of physical reality that, that sort of science lives within, where an object in science is, uh, is, is a result of sort of empirical investigation. Uh, and how those things can actually have a relationship with each other. And I think this uh, Bahamas Space Agency uh, is interested in investigating this sort of new approach to thinking about uh, the, the, the past, present, and future of how we, how we think about making things. And so then how did Blastoff play out as a piece exactly? I mean, what did you? That's a question that I'm still working out, to be honest with you. I, I don't know that, uh, I try not to think about duration. Uh, it's very boring to think about for me. So it's you're still, I didn't realize you're still part of, this is still a work in progress. Yeah, I think, I think everything that I'm working yeah, on is a work, work in progress, progress, yeah. progress for sure. Yeah. And this is the part I'm dying to talk to you about. <laughs> you train as a cosmonaut at Star City. Yeah. Um, is this you underwater? That's me underwater, yeah. Yeah. What inspired you to, to do that? I won't tell you which one is me, though. <laughs> is, that, is, that a is that a Russian secret? <laughs> Russian state secret? <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry, can you, can, you, can you repeat that question? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, what, uh, what inspired you to do this? I was interested in exploring these un sort of unfamiliar terrains and disrupting the conventions. Uh, of who is expected to be interested in this kind of material uh, so that maybe in uh, 25 years, uh, 50 years, 100 years, there's a whole host of explorers that come from places that are sort of branded as places that will not produce explorers. Uh, well, it's funny because I mean, you having to deal with the US um, the Department of Defense, and then it's, it's a similar thing in terms of who owns space or who gets to you know, control what goes up there. You know, obviously Russia, the other big space power. Um, so it's interesting the parallel there. But what was that like? I mean, did you just call them up or send them an email and say, I'd like to train as a cosmonaut, I'm an artist? That's exactly right. <laughs> in Russia. In Russia, yeah. Uh, in a way, that the, the system in Russia is a lot, the, the, the level of bureaucracy is a lot less than, say, working with an uh, institution like NASA. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and also, uh, a little secret, guys, if you tell someone that you're an artist, uh, they, they most likely respond to you. Uh, and it's really that simple. You're not a threat. No, you're not, not threatening. You're a military base. Uh, and, in, and in fact, I think, I think, I think this non-threatening uh, characteristic is interesting, specifically because um, I think between this sort of poetic space and this empirical evidence-based space is, is actually uh, creativity, is daydreaming. Mm -hmm. And I think no, uh, no matter what field you're in, uh, no level of innovation can come without that, mm. right? I mean, otherwise you're just repeating experiments over and over again if you're a scientist, and if you're an artist, you're just making the same painting. So uh, did this, how was this experience, um, 
I mean, I, I'm, I, I thought I was going to ask what you expected to get out of it, but I'm almost more curious, did, were you surprised by the experience? Was it, was, were there things about it that, that were just not what you expected or just go in completely open-ended in terms of what you thought it was going to be like? Yeah, I think a huge part of uh, my visual uh, knowledge of, of space has to do with NASA because, you know, proximity. And I think NASA has done a really good job of uh, branding the whole enterprise of space in a way that makes it seem woefully difficult and extremely inaccessible. And I think one of the things that I discovered in Russia was, for example, um, Star City is, a, is, a, is also a military base, which means when you pull up to the facility, uh, there are children running around. Um, there's, a small there's a small garden and farm. Uh, and it, it's filled with everyday working people. Uh, and it's quite beautiful to see because it's not this sort of separated uh, facility where, <coughs> you know, if you, if you don't have a, a red coat, a, a white coat on with a NASA patch, you couldn't get in. Uh -huh. uh, and it was quite astonishing to see. I think it was the most revealing component for me uh, of how human the whole experience was, believe it or not. No, I can definitely see that. And so then, uh, how did this influence um, orthotastic tolerance, the, the piece that I assume is still in progress then? Yeah, I think, um, so orthostatic tolerance is, is the, the discomfort uh, a person feels when he or she returns to, to home, to, to Earth's surface. Uh, and I, I really love that idea that, um, you know, returning home uh, makes you incredibly sick. Mm. Uh, and so th th this body of work, uh, this discomfort with familiarity was sort of driving um, this creative process for me. Um, and it was sort of underwriting uh, the strangeness that I had always felt as a, even as a child growing up, being interested in this kind of material. How does, how does one reconcile that? Um, how does one uh, feel alone in, in being interested in something and still sort of barrel through it? Uh, end up making, hopefully producing something. I like that idea. Um, so now one thing you guys both have in common is, as we talked about earlier, Bahamas, Mexico are countries we don't usually associate with space. What does it mean for communities and countries and people to have access to space for that, that have not previously had access to space? What, talk, talk to me about why that, that is so important to both of you. It was because Neil Armstrong said, small step for a man, a big <laughs> leap for mankind. <laughs> but I, I, when I showed up, and I said, I'm mankind. <laughs> 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 NASA said, you cannot come in. Yeah. <laughs> you, you need to be accompanied by someone from NASA if you want to wander around Cape Canaveral. Hmm. I, I, I've always had a, a really base level belief that uh, every human being uh, is, is talented at something. Uh, and I think it's just a matter of each individual figuring out what that thing is. And I think when, when you look at these under um, uh, represented, underexposed groups of people to this technology and to these ideas and to this realm, I think there's the potential for these pools and pools of talent. Um, and I think, in a way, the, the, you know, the sort of singular direction that exists a lot of times in, the, in scientific process, uh, it, it misses so much because it's devoid of um, a certain level of diversity in, in every direction. And, and so it's interesting even talking to uh, scientists about uh, their, creative pro their creative process as creative process, because it's like, wait, what do you mean creative process? But ultimately, like I said earlier, if you're, if you're, if you're uh, not interested in creativity, then you're just repeating experiments. Um, and so I think there's this uh, uh, insane potential for the next uh, great engineer or the next great chemist to come from a place that uh, you know, is completely isolated and devoid of, of physical resources more than it is likely for that person to come from somewhere that is rich. Now, it's funny. Now, my podcast usually 
I mean, I talk with a lot of writers and filmmakers. Um, I don't talk with a lot of artists. I mean, it's funny because science fiction, uh, we're so used to the, the fu space being given to us through movies, television, novels. Um, what does art bring to that conversation? What can artists, visual artists, bring to that conversation that's different? The, in, in terms of the future of, of science? I think in terms of just sort of like showing people um, the, you know, this is space, and, you know, th this is how we should imagine space and imagine ourselves in space. Well, it, it depends a lot what you call an artist. Julio Iglesias is an artist. His or, space albums are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> or Frank Sinatra is an artist. Yeah. And uh, I think the artist has been put away from the social environment. There's Whenever you draw that organization charts to know how to make a hospital, there's never an artist in that uh, organization chart or in school or whatever. The artist is always wandering somewhere there. And uh, I think what is very important is to bring the art back to the organization chart, the social organization chart, because uh, I think artists are like a catalyst of things. Uh, they are creators of metaphors. So the actual ownership of your house is a metaphor because it's a piece of paper. And reality is a metaphor that is being created by a very bad poet. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we need better poets generating reality. I, I wonder, too, if there's something a little bit more democratic in terms of anyone can you can sort of declare yourself an artist and create art with whatever materials you want as opposed to a filmmaker. You have to go through the system or if you're a novelist, you have to get published by some giant, you know, you can try to self-publish, but you know, there's a marketplace. And I think maybe, maybe is it the fact that you don't have a marketplace that you have to worry about in terms of your ideas, that, that can be more, you know, allow more creativity and freedom. That's what I meant, that we are outside of the organization. Yeah, <laughs> so it's good and bad in that sense. Yeah. Well, you, you are outside of the social tissue. But I also think it's it's important to to recognize that I think there's a there 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 are layers of art art fa like art worlds, uh, and so the conventional art world the, the art world that maybe if you close your eyes and you think of it is uh is New York Paris uh, L A et cetera, uh, and if you think of that world that world is is as conservative as 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 any other uh, yeah. small small community, um, and I think it's important. To, to also for us to consider that that there's a certain smallness that goes along with that, and I think that's that's a great misconception that people have that it's this free flowing, open minded uh, space, and it, it's actually completely the opposite. That's true, and also it's a world that's just as dependent on who you know as yeah. you know, as Hollywood is in many ways. I mean, are either of you fans of, of science fiction? Are you ever influenced? Has, has any science fiction ever influenced you as much as real astronauts or cosmonauts? Well, the, my problem is that I was born in 1961. So basically, the space race and all the narrative of reaching space and the Apollo program, and it was very important in TV. You, need, you did not need science fiction because, mm. it, because it was happening. And, and you had the, the Sputnik going on and the Russians going, and, and that was pretty amazing on itself, everything that was happening. I think later, later on, or I don't know, you, you had all this Star Trek happening in a very parallel way. It was because you were interested in space, you wanted to see science fiction. Right. More than you were interested in science fiction, and therefore you were interested in the space program. I, I, I think the, the, the capacity of wondering, of, of surprise, was the other way around. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I was born just a decade later, but for me growing up, it was the Challenger space shuttle is going up again. I mean, mm -hmm. we had, of course, it you know, blew up, and that was obviously very, very tragic. But um, there was a sense of, you know, sense of monotony to the program overall when I was a kid in the 80s, you know, where is this going kind of thing, which is different. Yeah. Star Wars messed it up a lot because it, it, you're, you're, 
people are not amazed at things since they watched the first <laughs> Star Wars movie. Mm. So basically, there's some science fiction that has harmed us a lot. That's interesting. Yeah. Because you know the special effects, everything seems possible just by going to a special effects company. Yeah. You go to Pixar, Pixar does it for you. Right. I mean, to some extent, do you, do you feel with your work you really want to help inspire a sense of wonder again in people? I think you could need a sense of future. A future. More than wonder. I think you need to think that there is hope and we're constructing something, not immediacy. I think young generations are very immediate to getting uh, the reward and basically they think that the world is going to end tomorrow. So they need to get the gratification very quick. Yeah. Or my generation did not have, I don't know, you're, you're, you're younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> I think what, what's uh, inspiring, potentially inspiring about this whole space project in general is that it, it's, it's really faith-based. As much uh, as it's underwritten by science, uh, we can we can probably name all of the humans that have ever entered space, which means it's deeply reliant on storytelling, uh, and that storytelling um, is 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 supremely important. All of the film that, that's made about space, and uh, all of the poems, and all of the songs, uh, movements, uh, you know, social movements, political movements, uh, all are based on this idea that only you know, probably under a few hundred people have experienced. Uh, so I think this is really a, sort of a rich uh, idea because I think within this idea, um, there's this potential for this kind of uh, um, uh, investment uh, in, in the future uh, in, and, and in wonder, if we can somehow unlock that. Because, you know, we, we, all, we all sort of believe to a certain extent. Yeah, I think possibly that could have been part of the inspiration for you. I know for a lot of people when Neil Armstrong did land on the moon, there was a sense of how long this had been in planning. You know, how many people maybe even didn't get to live to see that, but had been part of the beginning of that process. And so I could see why, you know, there's a sense of we lost that, that sense of investment. The mathematics is just to try to understand what the mathematics are to launch a rocket. Yeah. And to think that someone thought of it in 1903. I mean, Tsiolkovsky had the equation to launch something out of space. And if you see the sketches of Tsiolkovsky, are exactly the same ones that Kubrick used in the movie. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's a very int interesting relationship that someone in 1903 was helping the storyboard of, of 1969 that was 2001 Space Odyssey. So I, I think we need, we need to get back someone that is, is thinking forward and generating the mathematics of something that needs to happen in 100 years. Well, what's next? I mean, you've launched two of these so far. Where, where is this project go from here? Well, now I become addicted to space missions. So I, last, last year, I did bounce Don Quixote from the moon. So you what? <laughs> 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 Last year was the 400, the 400 anniversary, the 400 commemoration of the death of Cervantes, mm -hmm. and I was thinking a lot the message that Earth should have to uh, intelligent extraterrestrial life, and I decided that if a human being were to say hello, I come in peace, you said come on. So. <laughs> I, I was trying to work out which should be the message from Earth and not the Bible, because I, I think if we were to transmit the Bible, we would be in big trouble with any other planet. So I decided Don Quixote was a pretty good mm. <laughs> message to bounce off the moon. And I got a radio station to bounce it off the moon and to get it back to, to Earth. And I did also some transmissions to other stars. And it was very interesting because, uh, I mean, the, the fact of someone, of, of, of someone that goes mad because he read too many novels of chivalry, 
uh, and is fighting for whatever is good and noble, I think it really defines what the world is. I mean, we're, we, we try hard, we are mad, we accept that reality is mad and that's why we put on with everyday reality, but it's, it's, we are here because of madness, not because we are smart people. So I think if an alien were to see or to try to understand Don Quixote and come to Earth, it would make it would match perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> on that note, I'd love to transition to some questions. <laughs> do we have any? Do we have any questions? Hi, it's Ruth Jones. I'm a PhD student in space policy at Rand. Um, one of the main issues I've had with um, people who are working on space exploration are is that people like Elon Musk talk about it as colonization and colonizing Mars. Um, and I have a problem with this language um, because of the history of colonization globally and thinks that it makes space inaccessible. So I was wondering if you could talk about framing um, and how important it is for you to think about how to frame space for people in the future. I think uh, I think framing is is quite significant, and if you I had the privilege of uh, yesterday coming from a scientific conference, uh, and it's extremely uh, difficult uh, to go through uh, presentation after presentation uh, of charts and graphs, uh, and and a complete uh, denial of, of personhood. So you hear all these ideas and all these theorems and theories and theorems about what they're, gonna, what they're proposing to do, but you don't, you, you don't ever hear how it connects to the why. Uh, and I think, I think that's ultimately the question, right? So if we're gonna go to, to Mars, why are we going there? And, if the, and, and you're right, if the, if, if the only reason we're going there is to colonize it, uh, then that makes that endeavor completely, uh, completely ridiculous. Um, and so yeah, I think, I think, I think this is where the, 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 the sort of, um, the, the two sort of sides of the spectrum, the, the empirical science, uh, you know, experience and object making as truth versus lying, art making, uh, creative reverie uh, should, should collide. And when they collide, I think, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot more optimistic sort of view of the future. And it's not, it's not let's go to Mars and colonize it. Um, it's how do we make the universe better? I wrote a little text about how lawyers in Berkeley are studying law to know who owns space. And I was wondering if in another planet there's other lawyers discussing <laughs> <laughs> who owns space. And by the time we reach there, we are already part of someone there. So once you extrapolate things to a cosmic level, you suddenly the framing becomes very strange because you have to reorganize a lot of thoughts, concepts, ways of seeing people. And, and what is very interesting is when you bring it back to your world, not necessarily Mars, but basically when we are searching for intelligent life and we do not know how to deal with ourselves. So you, you can have a, a, a mathematical equation to meet other civilizations, but you should be applying here to meet your neighbor or to meet another nation or Brexit or you know whatever situation we are having of, of we cannot work as collective. And, and also that uh, in the West, uh, outer space was heaven for a long time. Yes. <laughs> I, th I always thought that was interesting. And then I was supposed to have, yeah. Um, so there's a general perception that um, artists and scientists are kind of polar opposites. Um, and, and I believe that, you know, there's probably, they're probably more related uh, than, we, um, than we're willing to acknowledge. My question for you is, um, what are we losing by um, enforcing this perception or misperception, um, and, and as an artist, would you like to see a rapprochement? I think, uh, I think the comment about madness is, is appropriate 
in response to, to your question. I think when, when anyone has been invested in a, in a process, a practice, uh, deeply enough and engaged enough, uh, we're all working on the same problem, we're all trying to solve the same problem. I think we're just coming at it uh, in different ways. And I think ultimately, uh, we're, I think our biggest challenge uh, uh, as, a, as a species is uh, we, have, we have extreme communication issues. Uh, and I think in order for us to overcome them, I think we all need to be a lot more um, multi multilingual. And when I say that, I mean, I need to understand enough about what you're doing, you need to understand enough about what I'm doing so we can actually talk to each other. And once we start doing more of that, then I think uh, we can start getting at the real, the real, the real problem. We can start solving real problems as opposed to kind of working out our own frustrations separately. I think the, the whole, uh, there's a lot of the problem that could be solved teaching people photography. Because we are not able to see. Most, most of our visual education uh, comes from, I don't know from where, because as a child, you are asked to read and memorize. And any illustration on a book has to do with a badly written text. So basically, you just read something that you could not understand, and you have to see the diagram, which you cannot also understand. It's a badly drawn diagram. And that's the way you reach university. <laughs> <laughs> so I think right now we're having a bad transition because phones are cameras, and people think that that is photography and it's actually transmission, it's broadcasting, it's not photography. And it is very important to learn how to, to generate, to, to be able to see, to observe, because you need to train the eye. And 70% of your brain is for seeing. So basically, if you do not learn to see, first of all, your part of your brain is not working, and it's only through seeing that you can have the compassion for the other person or, or that you can. So I'm, I'm really redesigning the human race. I'm basically going to elementary school and teaching photography as an interface for people to actually see and decoding what the eye is seeing. Because I think we have problems at, 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 at many levels in the conversation and the way that we see the other. By the way, uh, Lori Anderson was an artist in residence at NASA, I think about 12 years ago. Do you know Lori Anderson? She's a performance uh, artist. Um, and she did a live show about it that was really, it was very cool. I don't know, I saw it in Brooklyn. I don't know whether it was out there anywhere, but if you look that up, I think she joked she was the one and only and last artist in residence at NASA, but um, I'm sure that was probably an interesting experience. Um, are there other questions? work at NASA. I've done a lot with citizen science and prize competitions and getting the public more involved in our projects. Um, I wrote my do doctoral dissertation a couple of years ago on the space shuttle program and how NASA shifted from the Apollo program to the sh shuttle program in terms of how it involved people in, in different ways and, and how it redefined public engagement. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but NASA had a non-scientific payload program for a very short time on the shuttle program, which was actually um, encouraged by artists. It actually started by artists wanting to fly, fly their pieces of work into space. Um, it also had the teacher in space program. It was supposed to be a bigger citizen in space program. Both of those um, projects ended up getting curtailed with the um, Challenger disaster and never were resurrected in quite the same form afterward for a variety of reasons. But I'm wondering now, um, given your experiences, and thank you for sharing them, um, what you think the agency NASA could be doing uh, to, to bring people um, into the fold in a, in a bigger and better way? Um, I think, so when I, uh, when I first left the Bahamas, uh, I, was, I was almost embarrassed to be from such a small place because, you know, being an artist represented uh, 
this long sort of historical trajectory of artists that had come from Paris in America. And, uh, and so how does, one, how does one find room? Uh, how does one find that space? And so it was, a, it was this, I saw it initially as this huge, this huge uh, disadvantage being from this tiny island. Uh, and I think that now it's, a, it's an amazing advantage. And I think the question is not necessarily, for me, is not necessarily what can NASA do. The question is what can individuals do? And how can NASA inspire individuals to, to think differently about space exploration? And how can NASA say to people that we don't, we don't own space exploration? And I think that weight, that, that weight of ownership uh, and that historical narrative is, is, uh, is, a, is a part of what I think a lot of people may struggle with. Um, so I, I don't know if I answered your question, but I feel like it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extremely existential question. Like, like I think we're moving away, f I think we're, we're in some ways moving away from that model into something else. I have certain observations about, I saw all the directors of the space agency last year at the YAC uh, convention. And the, the problem is that you have NASA, Roscosmos, China, fuck. And China doesn't even make eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the guy of China just says, we have done 98 missions. And there's someone, a very fat man, translating behind him into English. And then you have the European, uh, the European space. And I, 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 I think the way things are divided, you cannot conquer space. So there, there is a need of talking to the Chinese. And the Chinese, they don't even tell you when they send the rockets. And there's been near misses to the International Space Station <laughs> and things like that. I mean, there are so little basic talking that I, I think you need a neutral zone called the citizens or the artists or, or, or just citizen science that could bring together somehow the Chinese, NASA, uh, Brazil that is now doing some satellites. I mean, you, you really need to open the channels of communications beyond politics because things become highly politicized. Uh, so there is no discourse. There is, an em there is an emptiness of discourse. So everything is 98 missions. And on the other hand, the private industry that is coming along with Elon Musk and Blue Origin, <clears throat> I have my problems why they are doing it. Because I have a suspicion that is pretty much like the internet bubble that was put together, in which you bring a great capital of money to put together, and then the bubble bursts. And I'm not very sure. I need, I, I need to go deeper there. But that I saw Elon Musk presenting his project to Mars and his dates for Mars. And it's just not possible. I mean, whatever he's delivering, because he wants to load fuel in orbit, and I want to see that happening, uh, it will take 10 years to do that successfully. So I'm trying to put together what it is possible to get the new boundaries. And you need NASA to think of space as China, India, uh, Russia, and, and you need to bring the virtues of each uh, attitude up. But it cannot be defense of each country and trying to block any development of rockets. I mean, th there, there has to be a, a conversation among all the, all the world, because if not, basically what you do is never get anywhere. You, you're chasing your own tail. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, we can do the last two questions since they are fast. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Victor Rogers, uh, also known as Slangston Hughes. Um, I'm a poet um, and an educator, and I work with the organization out of Baltimore, a literary organization. And when I'm not doing that, um, I'm a humongous Trekkie. 
Um, and so it's like poetry and space. This is literally my two loves co colliding. Um, but I think my question is kind of a two-part question <laughs> that's inspired by some of what's been said. Um, one, I think in the modern era of science, you see a lot more room where science and spirituality and creativity have more common ground and space for collaboration, where in past eras, it was almost unheard of. It's like, well, this is science, this is real, this is spirituality, this is things people imagine, you can't prove it. And where now there's been a lot of science coming forward that's kind of been like, yes, you can actually see where these two things aren't just connected, but they're the same thing. Um, and kind of with saying that also in that if we realize that we're all connected, would that not make it easier to collaborate as a species in general in, in trying to explore beyond our own planet? And we talked to a lot of astronauts. Um, one of the things they always talk about that was like a spiritual experience for them when all the science was over is seeing Earth from space for the first time. And the biggest thing they notice is that like the lines that we have on maps are not actually there on the planet. And it's like, if there are aliens really out there and they come and they like, well, you know these people, these guys actually think that, you know, there are lines where there's not and that they don't, they think that they're different from each other. Like, it's, they're crazy. Let's not bother with them. I don't know. Maybe if they heard Don Quixote bounce off the moon, they might stop <laughs> for a minute. Um, but just was wondering, like, what do you think about how in the modern era of, like, quantum physics and stuff, there are a lot of, cross-pollination between spirituality and scientific research and how that relates to the ability f for humankind um, to make an even larger leap in kind of realizing that working together is a better result getter than, um, like you say, all the different factions being split up and not really getting anywhere. You go first. Okay. Well, you see, the, the whole thing is a problem of, of semantics or grammar or language. Because when you try to talk to a nanotechnologist or you try to talk with an engineer that is really focusing in a problem to try to get space, and, and you come and you say, hello, I'm an artist, it's, it's just they ask for margaritas. You know, they, they, they have a hard time seeing where you are serious about it. So basically, in, in my research, I, I, I am trying to make up like a new type of career called like engineering in art or art engineering in the sense that you need to bring language together, that the words mean the same. Because when you're in a space, the basic thing is the mission. And the mission has a problem of language. Because even engineer of communication has a problem with the engineer of power, and has a problem with the engineer that is in the, in the earth base. And they have trouble communicating in a basic mission. So I took a course in mission. So, <laughs> so you, you have to broaden the concept of mission to become a global thing, to understand that the formality of the language or how you use the language is the capacity for artists and engineers and, and a lot of people to work together. But it's, 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 a, it's, it's a thing of writing and reading and learning how to read someone. I think uh, it, there's, a, there's an underwritten uh, sort of non-spoken hierarchy that develops when we're very young uh, through, through education and through how we teach. Uh, even how we separate and teach subjects, and how we create hierarchies, uh, and so for and and the the at a certain point visual thinking is devalued, um, and so all the questions about communication, all obviously re-enter the conversation again. How we how how can we be more equipped to, to speak to one another if from the minute you you enter a school system, you're taught how to speak different languages and never to speak to each other in those languages. Um, and so I think from, from the, the early stages, uh, art really has to be seen as uh, a uniter and not a divider, and not the thing that you do you know, to pass time before you go to do math. Um, I think the, 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 you know, the great Temple Grandin, I don't know if you guys know who she is, but she uh, 
talks all the time about visual thinking. And you know, there's so many talented students all over the country and the world who can't get into certain programs because they don't know how to do algebra, because their brains are not wired to work that way. So what are we going to do with all those, those kids? I think the communication, the, the, the fact that, uh, the two, two things, communication, the other thing is, uh, uh, how do we create, um, how do we disrupt the hierarchy? How does, how does engineering become as important as painting, as important as um, you know, nanofabrication, et cetera, et cetera? And in order for us to be able to speak to one another, there needs to be an, evil, an even um, uh, you know, playing, playing field. A Nobel Prize for <laughs> painting. Yeah. I think, uh, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. But uh, thank you guys so much. This is fascinating, very inspiring, too. and mentioning at the outset was that we really would love for you all to li linger and uh, have another refreshment and let's continue the conversation amongst ourselves so but thank you again and thank you for coming